Hello, and welcome to Implementing Spark Machine Learning Solutions in Azure Synapse Analytics here at the Scottish Summit. I want to take the time to thank the sponsors for the Scottish Summits because without their support, this event would not be possible. My name is Ginger Grant, and I'm really happy to be speaking here today at Scottish Summit. As I'm sure you have guessed by my accent, I am from America. I'm from the desert southwest. I am the principal consultant of my consulting agency, Desert Isle Group. I am often on Twitter, which is a great place to find me at Desert Isle SQL. I write my blog at DesertIsleSQL.com and speak whenever I get a chance. And most recently, that's been often on Azure Synapse. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Spark pool component of Azure Synapse. Azure Synapse Analytics is a pretty comprehensive product and it includes a lot of different functionality. You may have seen people use the serverless pools to be able to query flat files. You may have noticed that the SQL um, pools are now used instead of Azure DW as Synapse is a replacement for that. You may have noticed that the pipelines are an implementation of the same Azure Data Factory code that you have seen with a couple of additions. Don't have time to talk about every element that I could possibly on Synapse since I have a short period of time. So today I'm going to devote my time talking about the machine learning component which you use with the Spark pools within Azure Synapse. An Apache Spark pool provides open source big data compute capabilities, and they run as independent sets of processes on pools. These pools you create within Synapse to provide the resources you need to run Spark. The compute is separate from the resources so that you have the ability to turn the pool on and off and also select larger pools should you want your code to run more quickly. The pools are automatically configured with a shutoff timer, which will turn off the pool when no activity is detected for the number of minutes you specify. The default is 15 minutes, and this will help you reduce your Azure spend. It does take about two to four minutes for it to start up, and then you have full access to Spark pools within your Synapse workspace. The Synapse workspace, which of course I will be demoing, is contained within Azure Synapse and is a notebook environment where you can use to write your Spark code. The Spark code is um, open source Spark that Microsoft is embraced within Azure Synapse. Once you've created a Spark pool, you are going to be using that Spark pool within the Synapse workspace. The Synapse Workspace is a fully integrated Azure environment which provides all the security and organizational benefit applied within the application, including single sign-on and granting rights to different groups of users. Synapse uses the Interact Notebooks, which is an open source version of the Jupyter Notebooks, which was originally created to have Jupyter easily install on a PC. It contains some really nice extra features, including WYSIWYG Markdown interface, so you can bold something and it'll write the markdown for you. From within Spark Notebooks, it's really easy to load and access data stored perhaps in dedicated SQL pools, which are used for data warehousing. As a matter of fact, those are the new Azure SQL DW versions of it within Azure Synapse, or you might use it to access the Azure Data Lake Gen 2, which is generally used in the serverless pool, which allows you to do transact SQL on a flat table format. These can easily be accessed within Spark. Many machine learning elements are created on Spark because it provides the ability to interactively process experiments over a number of nodes, and this allows it to scale up to process them very quickly. And this in, improves the speed that it takes to evaluate different uh, algorithms. You can also, within Azure Synapse, integrate 
the Spark implementations with Azure ML, which allows you to utilize the management and deployment functionality within that application. Also within Azure ML, another popula popular integration method is to use the auto ML components, which are used to help select the best algorithm and create and recommendations for the best hyperparameters used when creating an algorithm and which is used in an experiment. This can save many data science development hours. Azure Synapse Analytics provides the ability for you to create your own code libraries so that you can um, load the code libraries that you want within your environment. It comes with built in with Anaconda provided for you. If you have been using Databricks, you may think that this is going to be a very similar implementation. And it is, and it, but it isn't. Microsoft is actually a big proponent of using open source, believe it or not. And Azure Synapse uses the open source implementation of Apache Spark, which is different from Databricks. They have implemented Apache Spark 2.4 which is not the latest version, but I'm hoping that the latest version will be released soon, which would be 3.0. It has also implemented Python 3.6. And the Spark implementation has multi-language support. It is the only version of Apache Spark out there right now that supports .NET. So if you want to write .NET code in Apache Spark, you can within Azure Synapse. It also supports Scala, Spark, Spark SQL, and Python. R is in the pipe is in the develop Microsoft's development pipeline, but it has not yet been implemented within Apache Sparks. Now Spark was designed to be an integrated library environment which is designed to take advantage of the multi-node compute resources that Spark makes available for you. It is from the Hadoop Collective, but it differs in that it loads everything into memory. And unlike Hadoop, it doesn't load three copies. It just loads one and iteratively processes over the different nodes that you have selected. This means that using Spark components your object will, will scale. You can write Python in Apache Spark and it will not scale up using the nodes that are available unless you use the Spark components. So it's important to remember to use those. The machine learning components of Spark are in the MLlib library. And its goal is to make practical machine learning scalable and easy. To take advantage of Spark, you really have to have an algorithm contained within MLlib for it to take advantage of the scaling and performance. MLlib contains a number of different components, not only to select the algorithms, but to improve the performance of the model. It contains all the common algorithms like classification, regression, clustering, and collaborative filtering, but it also includes deep learning functionality with the capability of in integrating TensorFlow with TensorFrames. It also contains a lot of featureization libraries to assist in modeling the data so the data can be structured in a way that's best used for the models. That's one of the great things also about Spark. Using the magic commands, you can write SQL within Spark and that will allow you to select your data that you're using your data frames that way. Spark is designed to work best on a certain kind of data structure format called Parquet. Parquet is also part of the Hadoop Collective, and it is a method of storing your data so that it does data compression, kind of similar to the way that the VertiPack engine within SQL Server and Power BI works in that it does columnar, um, columnar processing so that it could, does compression. So it processes files stored in that format best. Of course, you can use MLlib and Spark to create pipelines, machine learning pipelines that will allow you to evaluate, test, and train your data to create very efficient pipelines. The pipelines were inspired by, Py by Python's scikit-learn project. 
And with a pipeline, you use a transformer, and that transforms your data frame, which is where you load data within Spark, to produce predictions. And the estimator produces a model. And a pipeline just joins this together. For example, an algorithm like logistic regression is considered an estimator because it predicts labels for each element or feature vector. And then if you call the fix command, then it'll train the data into a model, which make is a transformer. Elements move from the transformer to the estimator to generate models. And once you have a model, you can tune it perhaps by modifying the hyperparameters and then persisting the model so that it can be called again. Microsoft is actually really into the open source community now. They're even developing additional components for Apache Spark. They've created a new open source library to help improve the functionality to provide capabilities that they think that would, would help Spark process language better. And the version that they created is called MML Spark. And that's designed to expand the, the distributed computing framework that of Apache Sparks into some new directions. ML Spark adds deep learning and data science tools to the Spark ecosystem, including seamless integration of Spark machine learning pipelines from Microsoft um, Cognitive Server, LightGBM, and OpenCV. We're going to be taking a look at cognitive um, services when um, we're looking at code that we're going to in Azure Synapse and machine learning. And these tools provide very powerful and scalable predictive analytical models for a variety of data sources. MML Spark also brings new networking capabilities to the Spark ecosystem because users can embed any web service into Spark MML models. So it provides really easy to use Spark ML transformers, which helps utilize cognitive services. So for production grade performance, the Spark Serving Project enables very high throughput sub millisecond latency web service backed by the Spark cluster. So within MML Spark, you have a machine learning deployment system called Spark Serving, and that helps deploy Apache Spark programs as distributed web services, and that'll provide um, additional flexibility and lower latency than existing frameworks. So basically, Microsoft has improved Spark to help it perform better and building on top of the functionality that it has. One of the things that they were interested in doing is improve the processing of Spark for deep learning to include a method for deep object detection capable of learning without human labeled data. It leverages the structured streaming and continuous processing and all code generation and graph building only occurs in initialization and the hot path of the request stays clear of unnecessary computations. Spark uses the batch processing API to evaluate data, which, which results in a lot of latencies as each call rebuilds a computation graph and then generates it and sends all the requests to the workers. But Spark has improved upon this process by changing the way the data is processed. And this capability, of course, improves the ability for calling cognitive services. Now you can create machine learning in Synapse just as soon as you create a Spark pool. And you can use the, the uh, Spark MLLib libraries to develop machine learning models. And you can deploy that as part of an integration pipeline within Spark, or you might um, include that in um, an, an MLLib managed component. These native capabilities um, help ex people who are really experienced with data scientists to start analyzing the data that they've made accessible from within Synapse. But you could also take something that you have already created and call that within a dedicated SQL pool using the predict statement. So it expands the machine learning to, uh, to be, allow you to call it from within a data warehouse, which is really kind of neat. You can then use that for model scoring to run your machine learning algorithm from within Synapse as well. In addition to these like native experiences, Azure Synapse can be expanded to incorporate other machine learning resources 
including Cognitive Services and Azure ML. And both of these applications have integrated UI experiences, providing a low code incorporation exper experience. What Microsoft is trying to do is kind of provide machine learning to the masses, which is similar to what they're doing within Power BI. So they have the, you know, just write the code, run it kind of capability, but they also are, are providing a guided UI experience with both Cognitive Services and Azure ML to help people who don't perhaps have a lot of machine learning experience get up to speed and implement it within, within Azure Synapse. So Cognitive Services provides a UI guided experience for two items, data enrichment with anomaly detector and text analytics using things like sentiment, anal sentiment analysis. And, and, um, and these are the two Cognitive Services incorporated and they're planning on doing more of them in the future, but these are the ones that are available now. But with Azure Machine Learning, you can leverage the power of machine learning within Azure to provide a rich code experience that allows you to do model training with AutoML. You can either write this in code or you can use the UI experiments. And when you do this, uh, you're using machine learning to select machine learning algorithms and of course their hyperparameters. And this allows the algorithms to be selected much more quickly and you can start utilizing data science without having to know a whole lot about the in-depth knowledge of how, how many different algorithms work. This exists in Azure ML workspaces, but they were originally created without Spark pools. And of course, now they are incorporating Spark pools within that application as well. So from within Azure Synapse, you can add machine learning components, accessing that functionality, including no code with machine learning wizards, um, or just calling the libraries using AutoML that is available to you from within Azure Synapse. The other thing that Azure ML contains is a registry to, to store deployed models, which you can call from within Synapse. And this will enable you to run your machine learning pipelines as a step within your Synapse pipelines and enrich your data with predictions by bringing a machine learning model from outside, from anywhere within the machine learning model registry and score that model. So Azure Cognitive Services are cloud-based services with REST APIs that allow you to build very advanced intelligence into your application using code that was developed by Microsoft Research over years and years. And this provides the ability to add very high level artificial intelligence without having to take the years and years that it takes to analyze and create some of these models. Azure Cognitive Services comprise various AI services that can allow you to build cognitive services that can see hear, speak, understand, and make decisions. Cognitive Services contains um, vision, speech, language, decision, and search. And these are used for things like, you may have seen um, a while ago, because it was pretty popular, the ability to determine how old somebody is by looking at a picture. It also is used quite often for sentiment analysis for various kinds of text determining the overall uh, positive or negative comment of spoken word or even with or even with videos and pictures. Now to set this up, there is some configurations that you need to do to configure cognitive services from within Synapse. The first, of course, the obvious step is you need to create cognitive services resources outside of Azure Synapse. And there are two that are used within Synapse directly right now, anomaly detector and text analytics. And both of these come with a free version, so you can use them right away without having to worry about your Azure spend. The Cognitive Services Wizard can be launched by right-clicking on a table and then select Machine Learning and then Enrich with the existing model. And the enriching is Cognitive Services. You will be asked to specify which Cognitive Services count to use, so you're going to have to then select the one that you have. 
And in order to authenticate cognitive services, you need to reference the secret that in your key vault. So prior to configuring cognitive services, you're going to need to create a key vault, um, create a cognitive services account, and then create a secret in your key vault uh, to allow you to authenticate your cognitive services resource. The cognitive services wizard can be launched by right clicking and then enriching it. And then you're going to be um, prompted to select from the list of cognitive services you have installed. When you've got either anomaly detector or text analytics installed, then you will have the ability to configure sentiment analysis to analyze the data that you specify. And then you can open a notebook, which generates auto generates a code for you so that you can run it. Now I know I've done a lot of talking about machine learning in Azure Synapse. So let's now take a look at it from within the code. Let's take a look at our Synapse environment within Azure. You can see I've got a number of different Synapse resources. When I create a Synapse workspace, this is the environment that it will create. You can see that the analytics pools, these are the resources that I have available to me. And you can see that there is a built-in pool. This is automatically created when you create a Azure Synapse workspace. And I have added a dedicated SQL pool, which is used for data warehousing. I've also created an Apache Spark pool. To be able to use these different elements though, we're gonna be loading Synapse Studio. So let's go ahead and take a look. This is the Synapse Analytics workspace, which we will be using for our development. When you first land, you'll see the recent places that you have been, if you have recent resources, and you also have the ability to get started. If you've not played around with Azure Synapse, I encourage you to click on this learn icon and it will provide you a good introduction to some things you can do within Azure Synapse. Now we're gonna be using notebooks, which is of course in the develop section, which is right here. and I'm gonna use my existing working branch. Of course, I've got source control set up within Azure Synapse. So I've got SQL scripts. These are used for different SQL development that I have done, and then I have my notebooks. So I've got some machine learning notebooks here. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of them. Now, of course, from within Synapse, the first thing I'm going to need to do is start my pool. So I'm going to go ahead and run this particular cell to load my bank classification information to start my Synapse pool. Let's come back when it's done. Now that our Spark pool is started, we can take a look at some machine learning created within Azure Synapse. Here I'm doing a classification algorithm. Classification algorithm is to determine one of two possible results, having an algorithm determine which one of these is the most likely. So here I am loading a number of different PySpark libraries. This code is going to be doing binary classification. And I'm going to do that on a um, bank marketing data set that I have within my Synapse environment. So within Synapse, I've got my data stored in my data lake, and that is also exposed here as a logical data warehouse, as well as in a blob storage, where you can see that I've got uh, my data set linked here as my primary data set. You do have to create an Azure data set Gen 2 element here, and this will show all the data that I have within my environment. So going back to the code that I, we were looking at for my classification algorithm, it's within my Azure Data Lake 
Gen 2 storage account. So I'm going to apply that machine learning on there and I'm going to get the data from my data lake and it is in raw CSV. Now I'm getting the path um, of my data and it's going to read my CSV file. So once I have read my CSV file, we can take a look at the schema for it. Again, this is um, bank data that I'm getting for doing a classification algorithm. So I'm trying to determine whether or not people within this data set are more or less likely to buy a CD given the um, algorithm. So I'm trying to predict that if you're going to be the type of client that would buy a CD from me based on the information that we have. So the information that we have is age, job, marital status, education, um, balance, housing, loan, contact, uh, when, when the contact was, the duration, the different campaigns, previous days, and previous outcomes, and whether or not a certificate of deposit was purchased. So showing my data here, we can see a sample set of the first five elements. Again, this is using Python. So this is showing the first five rows of this. And then I just want to group by my deposit. So my result to see if, which is set up here for one or zero. And I can see here that in my data set, I roughly have a pretty even distribution. I've got roughly 11,000 rows and a little bit more of them were no than yes in my environment. So what I'm going to try to do with an algorithm is determine how good I can predict whether or not someone is going to create a certificate of deposit. So I'm going to take a look at my data. Now within Spark, you have your ability to view your data in a very similar way that you do with Azure Data Studio. So I can look at it as a table using this display command, or I can look at it as a chart. And naturally, um, I have a number of different chart types that I can select. And if you are familiar with the way that Azure Data Studio works, you will notice that this works in a very similar fashion. So go back to the bar chart since that's the best selection for this particular data. So I can look at it either way. So then what I'm going to do is take a look at the integer elements and see how many integer elements I have and some statistical information about them, looking at the count, the minimum and the maximum. And then I'm going to group by the job, just doing some more SQL, taking a look at the different jobs that are selected um, with, so you know, just counting the different jobs within my data set, seeing how the distribution looks and how many missing I have. Unknown, relatively small here. And then I'm going to pre-process my data. I'm going to um, do what's called one hot encoding so that I am going to take my jobs here and I'm going to create those into columns and put a zero or one so that my algorithm will work better. And I'm going to create a pipeline and then I'm going to label my deposit command, my, my deposit column as a label so that this is the column that I'm going to be evaluating. And then I'm going to do some categorical and numeric differentiation here and index the categorical columns together and then the numerical columns and show first five of those. So I'm creating arrays out of them and, and showing them within my elements and I'm going to use this for my algorithm. And then I'm going to identify my index label here, my feature and taking a look at the data here and just listing it all out. Then I'm going to create split and training data sets. So I'm going to have 80% of my data 
be training and 20% be test. And the, here's the breakdown of the different elements. So I'm going to see if my algorithm can select better than the actual data. So I'm gonna train 80% and test it against 20%. And I'm going to just take a look at the first five samples. And this is the structured format that I have modified my data into so that it will process well against the algorithm. And then I'm going to evaluate my models, create a um, pipeline within Spark that is going to do a prediction and then I'm gonna show my prediction. So now I'm predicting whether or not my algorithm was successful. And I'm showing the first five here. So if we look at yes and no, um, I predicted no every time and I was wrong once, but that's not terrible. So let's look at this a little bit different way. And so this is the actual label and this is what I predicted. So again, I'm one off. And then I'm going to do a count to see how close I was between the predicted and the actual. So, you know, not terrible. And then I'm gonna um, measure my accuracy and see that my accuracy was 80%. Not bad for, and this was just doing a simple classification algorithm using data that I have stored within my data lake. Now let's take a look at cognitive services within Azure Synapse. So here you see that I'm importing MML Spark, the open source version of Spark that add-ons that Microsoft created to assist in calling cognitive services. So I'm going to import cognitive services from my PySpark functions here. Next, I'm going to select my um, Azure Key Vault and my um, text secret and link to my key vault. So I'm going to get my security information that I have set up here prior to being able to run this. So then I'm going to load my data into a Spark data frame. So what I am doing is I'm going to be analyzing customer comments using sentiment analysis within cognitive services and evaluating the sentiment of the majority of customer comments that I am receiving. So I am um, going to use the um, cognitive services and it is getting it from West US 2, which is where my cognitive services account is located. Actually, let's stop one second and take a look at that. So going back to Azure really quickly, you'll see that I have two cognitive services account. I have cognitive services text, which we are going to be using now, and then anomaly detection here. And these are in West US 2, and this is of course what was being referenced within my code. So if we take a look at this, we'll see that um, there is a quick start guide, and I'm running the calls for that within Azure Synapse. So heading back to Azure Synapse, I'm going to use that cognitive service that I have created here within my code, and I'm going to try to analyze the comments that I have um, within my data. And I look here and seeing that I've got some comments, and it's um, regarding ordering. And here you can see that somebody is um, saying that it's mixed but they were, because they were disappointed in the way that would be packed. And this one is rather negative. Can't believe you fools shipped me the wrong items again. Um, and then this one's really, this one they're saying, wow, I had no idea that this quality even existed. And there is steel and they're calling that one mixed. So that hand model needs a manicure, neutral. Um, and he, this one is negative. And um, here's, you will get a better response if you don't insult people you want help from. Oh, ouch. But um, so it's, what it's evaluating is determining whether or not that's positive or negative. So what we're going to do is we are going to save this as a table. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to persist my data into 
a table and then be able to um, take a look at that and um, see how that um, looks when I'm evaluating it. So like I said, this created a table. So let's take a look at the table. So if we go to data, we can see that the table that we created was in um, was in the um, select, we overriding this default customer comments. So we can see here that it is persisted as a table within um, our Spark default database, which is created as part of Azure Synapse. So we're able to analyze that data and then write it out to perhaps to do some in-depth analysis and reporting upon it. Now let's take a look at the last kind of code that machine learning code that were wrote in Azure Synapse. And that is machine learning code that implements resources from Azure ML. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to first get some data from an open data set. And what I'm going to try to do with this auto machine learning component is determine whether or not someone is likely to tip. So looking at those factors and using the components of Azure ML to determine whether or not someone is likely to tip. So I'm just loading up the data here. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to sample my data, just getting the elements that I want, um, previewing those. And then I'm going to split my data. Then what's going to happen is from my workspace, from my Azure ML workspace, I'm going to enter my workspace information because I'm going to be calling that and I need to reference that from within Azure Synapse when I am using Azure ML. So that is going to be using my Azure ML account, which you can see here, Azure Machine Learning Studio that I have associated with my Synapse workspace. So it is called Azure ML, and you can see that's what I am calling here. And this is the location for it. So what I'm going to do briefly is just create a um, tabular data set, taking a look at my data, just checking out what is going to be inside of it. And next, what I'm doing here while it's still running is I am going to be setting things in the auto ML area. So what I'm going to be doing in auto ML is I'm going to be looking at my, um, how long my timeout is that I'm going to take here, whether or not I'm going to allow early stopping. And I'm going to tell it that I want it to run four times. And the minus one just means that it's going to use its own logic to determine whether or not it's going to run. So I want it to predict it based on the prediction of the R2 score. And I want it to do cross validations. And I want it to do regression analysis. So what it is going to do here, it is going to go through all of the possible options that exist and then select um, different algorithms and then go ahead and run those. So it is going to run this and then it will have the best possible machine learning algorithm that it is running and then give me the response. While it's running now, let's just take a look at how that worked last time that I ran that. Let's just go ahead and take a look at it. And let's take a look at the models that it evaluated. Now remember we told it that we wanted it for the best R2 score. So it selected an algorithm based on that score and that algorithm is called voting ensemble. So it ran all of these different algorithms automatically and it tuned their hyperparameters, which is why you see some of them um, listed twice. Um, like this one is listed twice because the hyperparameters are different to determine which one had the best R2 score because that's what I said that I wanted to do. So it took a look at all these different algorithms, ran them all, and then compared the results. So it ran quite a number of them 
to find the best possible algorithm for me to use. So this is obviously quite a bit of code that on uh, and testing that it is doing automatically for me. And I'm calling this functionality from within Azure Synapse, but I am actually executing it from within Azure Machine Learning, and I'm calling it from Azure Synapse using the AutoML library, as you see um, listed, listed here, where I'm importing it into the workspace. And then I am um, importing the core data set and then setting using the auto ML settings. So this is just some examples of how you can run machine learning within Azure Synapse. One thing that I also wanted to show you is you have the ability to monitor your resources. And here you can see that the auto ML is still running. I'm here in the monitor section of Azure Synapse and it's showing me which applications are running, showing me that these have stopped and showing me the current status and what that's looking like right now. So. I can download my logs, look at diagnostics if I have any, and look at my pipeline that it is creating, showing the different elements of my Spark job. Here's the pools that I, my Spark pool that is running and you can see the status of it or if I have any other ones. Uh, if um, and you can see if I um, the status of everything that is running here to add and I to add the components for cognitive services I do need to go to linked service which is here in the manage section and this is where I have added both my Azure ML link service, providing the link to Azure Machine Learning, as well as to my Key Vault, allowing me to access these components. And that's all I have time for with Azure ML and on machine learning in Azure Synapse today. In summary, in this session, we took a look at Apache Spark, talked about how it was implemented within Azure Synapse, talked about the different languages that you can use, the, um, the different the versions that are supported. We also talked about MLlib, which is the Spark implementation of machine learning so that you can use it to take advantage of the clustered environment allowing you to scale your resources with your code so that it will process quickly. Then we talked about ways that you can expand your machine learning elements within Azure Synapse by incorporating Azure ML using the auto ML functionality and cognitive services, seeing how you could incorporate that within your code. I wanted to thank you very much for attending my session here at the Scottish Summit 2021. And I really hope that you talk this up on social media using the hashtag Scottish Summit 2021. And please, if you have any additional questions, feel free to ask me on Twitter at Desert Isle SQL. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity for being able to speak to you today about machine learning in Azure Synapse Analytics.